John for opening up this up. Uh, thank you, Reverend McCullough, for your inspirational words. Thank you, Sherry Hyman, for uh, being our, our most important neighbor uh, and the most important landowner, I think, in lower Manhattan. Uh, I would like to just take this uh, moment to talk a little bit about the National Institute for Coastal and Harbor Infrastructure. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization that uh, had its beginnings in Sandy. Uh, you think that maybe this space was chosen because of the great view of the city. When you walk in, you have a beautiful view. Well, it really wasn't. Um, sometime in the day, if you have a chance, go to that corner, strain around the curtain, and you will see a red ship docked below you. That's why this was chosen, because we could see the ship that Chris and I own. And we can see it clearly from this window. But we, we had that ship here in Sandy, and I was on that ship, rode out the storm, came back to New York City. And it was the devastation that I personally witnessed at that time that inspired me to get together with John and Paul Josephson and, and Jim Cantwell and the other members of the board that are here today and some that are not, and form the National Institute for Coastal and Harvest Infrastructure. Uh, we are an action organization. We have three goals. We want to change national policy. We want to change policy from a policy focused primarily on disaster relief and recovery, where we spend uh, literally hundreds of billions of dollars to rebuild often 19th or 20th century uh, infrastructure and leave it weaker than it was before. And we want to shift that to a policy where we invest in new infrastructure that's designed for its purpose. Uh, and designed not only for resilience, but to bring multiple benefits to the coastlines. We want to reimagine the coastline of the United States. We used to be a great maritime nation. Uh, any of you that have gone to Abu Dhabi or Dubai or to uh, the great ports of China or to Singapore or to Western Europe, you'll know that we're not the great maritime nation we used to be. We're second rate maybe even third in some areas. We can't even dock the Panamarian class uh, ships that are coming through the Panama Canal in more than a couple of our ports. We have our people, 45% of our population lives in coastal counties. We've lost hundreds of lives to extreme storms and rising sea levels. We're losing large portions of real estate now. So we need to focus and refocus on our coastlines and to rebuild our coastlines to protect people to keep up the lights on, keep our feet dry, but also to invest and preserve our natural resources and rebuild America so that we are competitive again globally by being that great maritime nation. Our second point is that we want to have single federal agency leadership. There are many, many programs out there trying to focus on what is really soup du jour, uh, the soup of the day. This is a very popular subject matter, but it's not popularity we seek. It's not even uh, uh, acknowledgement of the issue. What we want is action. We need single federal agency leadership to lead the way on that. The third goal of Nietzsche is to look at uh, the funding on this. In the 1950s, uh, General Eisenhower came out and said, we've got a national security issue. We've got a national economic problem here. And what was his solution? To build the interstate highway system. The reason, the primary reason for that was stated as national security. We have the same situation today. As you're here today, uh, we have a national security crisis. Uh, and we have, uh, we have to address that. We have a homeland security crisis we have to address. So what we want to do is have funding to rebuild an integrated interstate coastal infrastructure system around the entire coast of the United States and fund it through dedicated revenues to a, uh, through a single agency with funding equal to the federal highway program so we can tackle this job. It's going to reinvigorate America and it's going to be a tremendous jobs bill and it's going to create an America for the 22nd century. So those are our three goals. It is uh, with a real pleasure that I have the privilege of introducing the next speaker. Uh, Commissioner Jacobs is one of those rock stars you hear about. Uh, she's been a rock star in politics, but she's been someone that has uh, a true vision of how we actually change things. Five years ago, while a lot of us were still uh, looking our wounds from Katrina, but 
hadn't seen Sandy yet and weren't sure what was happening. The commissioner had the foresight and vision to set up the Southeast Florida Regional uh, Climate Change Compact. Did I get that right? Yeah. And, uh, and this, this pulled together counties from Palm Beach to Miami so that we could have an a integrated section of coastline. Think about that coastline. Four ports in that coastline. And she had the vision to get people working together on climate change and resiliency. But she didn't stop there. Last November, when the president said, enough is enough, I'm not going to wait for Congress, I'm going to plant the flag on the mountaintop, and I'm going to say, we're going to do something about climate change. But we need the best and the brightest to have input into this. So we're going to set up a, a, a task force on climate preparedness and resiliency. And who did he look to? Commissioner Jacobs. He not only made her a member of that task force, but he actually uh, appointed her co-chair of the built subgroup that's in looking at all infrastructure, whether it's water, transportation, uh, or, or uh, utilities, or any of the vital infrastructure of the country. And finally, uh, you know that we had a major event at the White House yesterday. Three of our speakers, at least three, maybe more, uh, were there uh, speaking at that event. That's how significant this event is. And Commissioner Jacobs uh, presented there and then jumped on a plane and came here last night. And we are most fortunate to have the former mayor of Broward County, the current uh, county commissioner of Broward County, Kristen Jacobs. Please come up. Before you go, how do I, I I'm, I'm really great at climate change, but not at presentations. I just push the green, okay. It's red, it goes back. That's what I'm told. Okay, yeah, that's, so, right. that's right, we're getting the thumbs up. Well, good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here talking, talking about my favorite topic, and that is climate change and what we can do about it. One of the things I'm hoping to leave with you today is not the sense of doom and gloom, although some of the slides I'm going to show you do paint a rather daunting picture of the future for South Florida, but really to help all of you kind of underscore one of the themes from the White House yesterday, and that is that Americans are resilient. We always manage to figure out a way to make a buck on anything, and when we look at the challenges facing this country, while we are slowly grinding into, into gear and folks are starting to pay attention and there are no shortage still of those people who want to deny that it's happening. The good news is um, that all of, all of those people, certainly those in this room um, and those that are out there writing about these issues are starting to really pay attention and understand the, the economics of what's at stake and we're starting to have a different conversation um, in this country as we have so sorely needed. Uh, so, give you some, some perspective. The state of Florida, uh, Broward County is there in the red. Um, Broward County is about 1.8 million people. We are the second largest county in the state and collectively um, uh, Broward County has about, between Broward County, Miami-Dade and Palm Beach County, the counties to our north and south represent about a third of the state's population and about a third of the state's tax base. Uh, you can see when you look at the state of Florida, as you look at the southern area, that um, we have we have a lot of coast and we have a lot of water, and we are truly very vulnerable to what is happening to us in sea, with sea level rise. This is a picture of Broward County. You'll see that Broward County urban area actually represents only about a third of the county geography. We are, uh, the rest, all of that western area is Everglades, it is all in conservation. There aren't too many communities that can say that two-thirds of their county are held in conservation, but we are. The urban development line here is actually the levee. And most people don't know that the Everglades sits up here and the urban area actually sits lower. When you look at this picture, and one of the things I think is so remarkable is how much blue there is. Every one of those blue lines are canals, or um, retention ponds or any other way that we have come up with to keep draining water off of the land base because if you look to the east side you'll see that it is um, there's just a few areas where there are, are blue lines and that's because uh, that's the highest and driest part of the county in ancient sand dune um, that represents the area that we first started to develop and then over time figured out ways to drain and continue to move forward uh, and, and continue to build. 
So we have about 1,800 linear miles of canal systems in Broward County. And I encourage people when they're talking about coastal issues and sea level rise to take a look at Broward County and realize that when we talk about sea level rise, we're not just talking about effects on our coast. Uh, it's the inland areas that are really suffering the most from sea level rise impacts already. So Broward County's Port Everglades, uh, when we start looking at the infrastructure that's at risk from sea level rise, uh, Broward County's Port Everglades is the number one container port in the state of Florida. It's the number one seaport for revenue and exports. It's the third largest cruise port in the world, the second largest foreign, foreign trade zone in the United States, and it's the second largest petroleum port in Florida, serving much of the southeast uh, uh, U.S. And in fact, in Broward County, all of the fuel comes in from Port Everglades for 13 counties and four airports. So certainly Port Everglades is situated right smack in the middle of an economic engine, not to mention the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood uh, International Airport, which is not in Hollywood. They managed to sneak their name in there. Um, the airport now is undergoing expansion. We're spending about a million dollars a day out at the airport, extending the runway and redoing terminals, so there's a lot of work going on there. This is just one example of the critical infrastructure and the services that are supported by a coastal community, and its importance is on a much broader scale. On a national level, about 39% of the U.S. population resides in a coastal county, and I heard someone say 45, I've heard it as much as 60, so, you know, the one thing they say about statistics, they're made up on the spot. Um, so I'm not sure about the 39 or the 45 or whether it's 60, but certainly we know that um, coastal counties collectively account for nearly half of the national GDP. It should be an international imperative that we maintain and invest in the infrastructure of these communities against the impacts of climate change and sea level rise to ensure that the economic integrity of our nation continues to move forward. And as has been said, this is not a problem that we can put off um, thinking that at some point in the future, uh, things that are something that we need to deal with. In fact, it's something that we know we need to be dealing with now. Um, Okay, I talked about that. This is a photograph of Palm Beach County. Um, this is a rain event that happened in Palm Beach County that dropped an extreme amount of rain. It's what they call a one in 1,000 year uh, rainstorm. It was from last January. 14 inches of rain fell in just three hours in Palm Beach County that led to massive flooding and loss of life. It's interesting when you look at the way that this is not Palm, uh, Broward County, but we are developed very much the same as you see all the houses sit up on their pad high and dry. Some of the roadways are actually above water, but the rest of the infrastructure is all underwater. Um, these are just some of the beginning things that are happening in South Florida on a, re on a rather regular basis. Those things that are going to continue to happen to us uh, and other areas around the country, hotter temperatures, public health challenges as a result of standing water and other issues, ocean acidification and warming impacts to the three-tier coral reef system in Broward County. By the way, if there are any divers in the room, you may think that going to the Florida Keys is some of the best diving in the country, but actually it's Broward County. It's accessible right offshore and it's really beautiful. It is also that three-tier coral reef system that protects our shoreline and all that infrastructure there from the ravages of storms. Um, and in addition to some of the other problems that I've mentioned, this stresses to the Everglades system, which is truly what we say in, in uh, Broward County is we need to fight water with water, and that is the Everglades, a fresh water that runs slowly through the, the Everglades of the state of Florida is that freshwater head that cons consistently pushes back against the saltwater head and keeps saltwater intrusion somewhat at bay. So this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a house, as you see, it's for sale in Fort Lauderdale on a beautiful sunny day. And it's another beautiful sunny day. We had no rain, but this is sea level rise. This is happening all the time. When we have a full moon in Broward County, this water comes up to the very system that was designed to drain water off has now become the conduit for salt water to come in. It comes in from the intercoastal and backs up through all of the drains. Um, the cost of sea level rise is huge when you consider the amount of real estate that is, that is at risk. These numbers just show the beginning pictures. The picture to the left is a business on Las Olas Boulevard, um, right off of, of Broward Boulevard. Um, this is, again, this is no rain. This is just simply tidal movement. 
So I talked a little bit about saltwater intrusion. As you see on this slide, there is a red line that runs up our coastline. Everything to the east side of that line, every well has been lost to saltwater intrusion. As sea level rise continues to move up uh, or move inland, we're going to continue to see the loss of our freshwater well supply. Um, and what's difficult for Broward County is that unlike Miami-Dade and Palm Beach County that basically have one utility running their county, in Broward we have 31 cities and 28 individually governed uh, water utilities. It is a Herculean task to try to get all of these utilities together on one page, although through the Water Resources Task Force, which I chair, we have made some amazing advances in working together. The issues facing South Florida right now is you can only put so many straws down in to pull water, fresh water up. As the community continues to lose wells on the east side of our county, those utilities will have to reach further inland to get their water. And most likely, the utilities that they will move inland to retrieve that water from do not have the infrastructure to handle all these new uses. It's not like you have a bunch of condos being built and, and new users coming online. Rather, you're trying to bail out the utility next to you. The infrastructure is simply not there. Um, the county has been working for quite some time to reduce our water needs and, in fact, went to year-round water, uh, I mean, year-round water restrictions two days a week several years ago. Um, and many other programs that have been put together, which I won't go into today, but suffice to say that in collaboration with the 28 water utilities, we have managed to reduce the future uh, water needs for Broward County by 50%. It's been an amazing journey to get to that place, working cooperatively with the cities and the individual utilities. This is A1A. This is Superstorm Sandy a la uh, Broward County in the state of Florida. What you see at the very bottom of the picture is sand, the little bit of sand that we had left, but what you don't see is how far out that beach actually went. This is A1A, the main uh, route that, that goes along the city of Fort Lauderdale and along our beaches. Um, this, this A1A is also the evacuation route, the main evacuation route for that part of the barrier island, and it simply fell into the sea. So this project was rebuilt at a cost, uh, an extreme cost, um, probably around, I think it was around $20 million to just to put this roadway back. When they put it back, they built it back a little more resilient, which you don't see uh, in this picture. I don't think I have a picture of it having been restored, but they put these uh, baffled steel walls that went down 60 feet into the ocean just to make sure that you wouldn't have this constant erosion of, this, of the sub base. So I talked a little bit about water coming up through our drainage system. This is a, an actually a manhole cover. Um, so there's been some discussion about putting up all kinds of different structures to try to keep the water out, but the truth is we sit on very porous limestone. We're basically sitting on Swiss cheese and you can't build any structures to keep that water out. Wherever we have um, been uh, addressing the issues with some of the drainage, it's coming up through manhole covers, it's coming up through uh, paver system. It's, it's, in the, it's amazing. Water coming area out to um, the Everglades. And what is frustrating is we continue to look at all of this water that's happening and being ponded in the central part of the county. The only place that it can go is sea, as sea level rises and the salinity gates, there are 11 of them at our shoreline. Um, those gates can't open to, or can't close rather, um, to get the water out, and so because of that, we have to pump it out the backside. And increasingly, we're starting to see the urban runoff and all the pollution associated with that going into the Everglades. Um, yesterday, as was mentioned, was a really exciting day, I think, for our country, and that was the release, the third uh, update of the National Climate Assessment. It's certainly impressive to take a look across this country and see the needs. Well, I'm so familiar with what's happening in the state of Florida and the needs, particularly in South Florida. Um, the truth is that there are issues happening all over this country. And the National Climate Assessment really took a, a, a long look at the infrastructure of this country, what's at risk, and what we need to be doing to understand our vulnerabilities. I would encourage you to go online and learn all that you can. The book is, the summary alone I think is 20 or 30 pages long. 
um, if that's not the big enough hook to, to draw you in, um, go online and see some of the, the dramatic photo, photographs and, and uh, work that's been done. It was a thrill to be part of the release of that document yesterday at the White House. Um, the National Climate Assessment for Florida shows some very significant changes for us in the future. Many of those changes are happening to us already through the increase in temperatures. Um, while we don't expect to have new or greater numbers of storms, we know that the ones that come will be of greater severity, causing much more damage. Um, we are looking at a doubling in the rate of global uh, of, of sea level rise um, over the previous decade. And surely we know that we can't look backwards to see what the future will look like anymore, even though their legislature in South Carolina uh, wanted to see that happen. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the legislature in South Carolina that said that you can only measure sea level rise looking backwards. The legislature prevented them uh, through law to look forward. We know that that's not the best way to go. Um, some of the partners that, that happened to come together for um, the task force uh, here, you'll see the federal partners and all the different programs of dealing with state resiliency, the strategy of uh, the Regional Climate Action Plan that was put together by um, Broward County, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, as well as the Broward County-wide focus on, um, on what it is that we can do in adopting those plans. The Presidential Task Force on Climate Preparedness, I, I have remained immensely um, impressed with our president to look forward and understand what the challenges are facing this country. But he did something interesting, and that is that he put local governments at the table. Uh, we, uh, you may have heard the expression, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And it seems, it really feels sometimes like local government is always on the menu. And to sit at a table with eight governors uh, 21 member task force, eight of them are governors, the rest are mayors from cities across this country and three county commissioners. To be able to look at the challenges that we are facing as a nation and understand that the federal government spends money every day in our communities. There are grant opportunities, there are investments by the federal government, and wouldn't it make more sense if those investments were tied to vulnerability analysis? What if every dollar that came out of the federal government came with sort of a hook? that said, okay, here's your dollars, but what are you doing in your community to get ready for climate change? Where are your vulnerabilities and where are your priorities? We want to ensure that the dollars that we send down to you are being spent wisely, which is a great thing to do, but it's not so great if the locals are not sitting at the table to help define what the, the ways in which those dollars should be spent. And what's interesting about what President Obama did was not only to put cities and counties and states at the table, but he also put the tribes at the table, a really important part of, of moving forward. So the task force is organized through a series of work groups. I'm super excited to be co-chairing the built systems uh, and infrastructure work group. There's also the disaster recovery and resilience, natural resources and agricultural, human health and community development. Um, in the Build Systems work group, we have been reaching out to so many different groups to have their input come in so that we can understand um, a, a variety of points of view. The President made it very clear that the clock is ticking, both in terms of his presidency and both in terms of our need to get in act to, to create action and move forward. He's understandably frustrated with Congress these days. They don't seem to be getting too much done and understood that if you are really going to get things done, we need to get it, uh, these recommendations in quickly. So he has asked that all of the recommendations from all these different groups comes forward to the White House by May 27th. It's been um, a lot of work, uh, a lot of effort being put in by a lot of different groups. Um, and I have a lot of hopes that we're going to be able to bring the President recommendations that his administration can put in place today uh, and not have to wait for congressional action. So I wanted to also talk to you a little bit about my favorite project, and that's the, climate, the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. It occurred to me as I chaired Broward County's Climate Change Task Force that Miami-Dade County was struggling with the same things that we were. They had a task force and they had a series of recommendations that were coming forth. It had been blessed by the elected officials that sit on their dais, just as it had in Broward County. 
in Palm Beach County, the story was the same, and so was Little Monroe County down at the end, um, struggling not just as I showed you in the pictures with high tides that were affected, um, affecting the community during full moons, but in Monroe County, in fact, they are having the backup of seawater through all their drainage systems every day with the movement of the tides. So much so that in Monroe County, Ford Motor Company is no longer honoring the warranty to their police fleet, fee, police fleet, boy that was hard to say, due to saltwater damage to the undercarriage and their fire hydrants are rusting away in the street. Clearly, it seemed to me that the solutions that we needed to, to go after meant that we should be walking together, working together, speaking with one voice. So that sounded like a really good plan, and then came the part of trying to make it happen. Um, what we, the, so in approaching the elected officials from all four counties, we had a conversation that started very simply. Let's just see if we can agree to do two things. Let's see if we can agree to have a summit once a year so we can look and see how much progress that we've made. And we will agree that any dollars that we bring together as a, as a, in the form of grants or anything else that comes to the community, we will split amongst the four counties evenly, not by population because that would cause some, some friction, but let's just agree up front. So it isn't, it, it isn't that it was such a huge ask, it was that there was such mistrust amongst all the different governments that if we came together, Miami Dade was with Spring Broward County, just wants our money. Um, and, and the day that the item came forward to be voted, each of the large counties started to change a word here or there. It actually took us an entire year to pass that first compact um, agreeing to work together. Um, we've come a long way. This fall makes almost six years, well, it's our sixth year that the compact has begun to work together. And last year, as mayor of Broward County, I approached the mayor from Miami-Dade, who is a Republican, the mayor from Palm Beach County, who is a Republican, and said, you know, we've gotten pretty far along in this climate compact, and we've learned how to work together. We ought to take this example and just blow it out. Why don't we go and adopt a new compact? What if we were to add transportation? What if we were to add voting rights? What if we were, because we have some issues with voting, as you may know, in the state of Florida. Um, uh, and what if we were to talk about Everglades restoration, which we know is really the thing that's got our back, again, fighting water with water. And there was no partisan discussion there. It was a conversation about what's good for our region. Uh, uh, and so we passed the second compact, which isn't on the slides here today. But what's interesting about the difference in the second compact is it was one day, one vote, three days is up, down, not a problem, versus the one six years ago that took us a year. Monroe County had to adopt this, comp this climate compact three times because Broward County and Miami-Dade and Palm Beach kept changing a word here or there. Palm Beach actually had to put it on their agenda and adopt it twice. And each time it came up for another elected body for a vote, I just knew it's going to fail. There's just no way this is going to happen. On the last day that uh, the item came up before Miami-Dade for their vote, FPNL, the state's power company, was going out. I sent my aide down to go start talking because it was starting to fall apart. Miami-Dade was not going to vote for it. Uh, so she's coming and going in and out. It's the same day that we're having our county commission meeting. Every door she comes out, FPNL has been in before, and what they wanted was language that said that nuclear is a renewable energy source. So I quickly got on the phone and thought, you know, when do words become weapons? That's what's happening here. This will kill. That language would, Monroe would, would freak out. They would not want that language in there. They would not vote for it again. Palm Beach County might not vote for it. So began a series of conversations, rushed through all of the commissioners that we could to say, look, Let's just adopt this thing. The importance is to get it adopted. Who cares what's in there, this, some of this language? Let's just move forward. And we did. It passed, and we've moved forward ever since. Um, and we still know that renewables uh, don't include nuclear. But it's interesting to see how by working together, all of the different efforts that we have made as four counties really comes back to a series of relationships, both those relationships built by our staff working with each other, as well as county commissioners working together in, and pulling in the same direction. So the compact has now adopted um, a, a variety of, of, oops, I didn't need to go to that one yet, a variety of, of um, um, I guess, implementation standards that we have put in place, 110 
policy recommendations that were adopted by all four counties um, have now been, been moved from policy to implementation. We were able to draw down a Kresge grant for about a million dollars. That Kresge grant took us and gave us the ability to hire personnel to now work across the, the four counties and bring us all together toward implementation. Um, the, 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 the sectors that are now in that plan c cover energy, water, transportation, sustainable communities, natural systems, agriculture, out outreach, and public policy. Our call to action. This is our time. Our president has called us all to stand up and work hard, not across party lines, but to break them down and move forward because they're worth it, we're worth it, our country is worth it, and we're never going to be able to move forward if we don't all actually get up and work hard to make that happen. I know that you are all here today because you care deeply about these issues. I'm hoping that you'll go back. There's a lot of other speakers here today that I think that will be um, in inspiring and help you in that regard. If there's any other ways that um, you would like the resources of, of South Florida to, to help you in this journey, we are at your disposal. And I just truly thank you so much for giving me the time today to talk to you. Thanks, everybody.